I'm excited to talk about two big words tonight, success and significance, and um, try to unpack what those mean and how we can be pursuing those in our life and in our career. Um, my journey with wrestling with this has probably been for the last 12 years or so, and it started not too different from where you are right now. So I, um, when I was in grad school and as a, when I was still a student, I started to think uh, in a little bit more of a global context than I had growing up. You know, I kind of grew up in a fairly uh, middle class suburban lifestyle that maybe is similar to a lot of you. And uh, it wasn't until I got into school that I started seeing the world in a little bit more of a global context. When I was in grad school, I studied um, economic development in sub-Saharan Africa and wrote, wrote a, my thesis on that in my, master's, in my master's program. At that point in time, I started thinking about these concepts of how macroeconomic conditions can actually affect the quality of life of an average person on the ground. And then in law school, uh, after grad school, I went to law school. I, uh, something really strange happened to me. In law school, you're supposed to kind of go, go to school and come out kind of being a, an abrasive jerk. And for, for some reason, I went to law school and I grew a heart. Um, and it was in law school that my, uh, my concept of justice was really, really informed. So I got um, really interested in two particular issues. The first issue was the commercial sex trade, and the second issue was extreme poverty, those living on less than a dollar a day. Um, and it was, uh, it was in that exploration that started kind of something started to grow within me, this, this desire to create something significant with my career. But I was just kind of a second year law student, and I didn't really know what I could do with that. I had this passion, but without an understanding of how I could put that into practice. So uh, when I left, when I left law school, or when I was uh, doing an internship between my second and third year of law school, I found myself in New York City, a city that I fell in love with, a city that's home to this day. And uh, I met some of my soon-to-be best friends. And they were working on a, an anti-sex trafficking nonprofit. Um, and over time, they invited me to come be a part of helping to think about how we could actually have an impact on this issue that all of us were so passionate about. So we're all young 20-somethings. Uh, in Manhattan trying to figure out how we can solve this incredibly intractable global problem. What we ended up doing was spending a lot of time on the ground in Southeast Asia, working with uh, organizations that were already established and then doing some work on our own as well. What we found is this, this huge issue of the, of the commercial sex trade is actually uh, a lot of different issues, a lot of smaller issues put together. And it's primarily driven by actually economics, which I, was, which I got interested in in grad school. Um, what we found particularly was that a lot of women that had left the commercial sex trade uh, oftentimes found themselves drifting back into it due primarily to a lack of economic resources. And that broke our hearts and it also got us thinking that maybe we could do something about that one small bit of the issue. Um, so what we realized after talking with them is they don't kind of, they don't see themselves as charity cases and they don't want our pity or charity. What they do want is an opportunity to have a good job and raise their family just like you and I do. And so what we, what we decided to do was a, a solution for that particular problem was to create a business that would help them, uh, that would employ them and help them move from the bars and brothels to a healthy, more stable life. And that's, uh, that's biography, this, this uh, socially conscious fashion brand that we created. Um, along with that, I've also been, I had the opportunity to work with, uh, in my law practice, work with a lot of really innovative social entrepreneurs that are thinking about how to solve big environmental and social issues of our day. Um, and I, I uh, spent a lot of time talking with 13 of, of I think, the best uh, in, order to, in order to write this book. So I have been thinking a lot about this idea of success and significance, and um, I don't know that I have it figured out, but what I want to offer tonight is a little bit of a window on how I think about success and significance and a little bit of a framework for uh, how you might want to think about it as you're thinking about your career and what you're going to do after you leave here. So success and significance, what do we mean by these two words? Um, they're kind of big words that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. I want to, you know, we probably all have our own definitions, but I want to lay out a, uh, a framework for us to think about success and significance that we could probably all basically agree with. So um, I want to um, use a framework that uh, a New York Times columnist, David Brooks, put together called uh, Resume Virtues and Eulogy Virtues, right? 
So resume virtues are those, uh, are those virtues that we put on a resume, that we, whenever we're marketing ourselves or whenever we're networking, we're putting to the forward. It's our, it's our learning, it's our education, it's the skills that we bring to the marketplace, it's our uh, connection to other people, it's our prestige, our power, and of course our money, right? So that's, that's uh, success, uh, how we're framing it tonight, is probably gonna be more on the resume virtue side. And then we have, we have eulogy virtues. Eulogy virtues are what we would love for people to say about us at our funeral, right? When people are recalling who we are in life, um, those are probably different characteristics than what we would see on our resume, right? These are about our relationships, about how we invested in people, about what we gave, and about the legacy that we're leaving. These are the eulogy virtues. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight as significance. Those, that's how we're defining these two terms. So we are different than any other generation ever in the, in the fact of how we think about success and significance. Um, if you ask our parents and generations preceding us, um, preceding them, they would probably have said, both things are good. Success and significance are great and should be pursued. Uh, but what you should really focus on is being successful first, then being significant. So our parents' generation, by and large, thought about success and significance sequentially. First, be successful, go make a lot of money, and then be significant. You know, you can retire, play some golf, and cut some checks to charity, right? After you get your kids out to college and all that stuff, right? Our generation is thinking about it differently. We want success and significance simultaneously. We want to be pursuing both at the same time. Uh, from my experience just talking with my friends and from talking with my students, this seems to be the overwhelming majority of our generation is thinking about, I don't want to wait until I'm 60 to do something good. I want to do something good during my career at the same time. So we want to do this simultaneously. The question is, is that possible? Is it possible to pursue success and significance? And what does that mean? Um, and is it an easy path? If so, what does the path look like? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So this is the advice we've been given our whole life, right? Follow your heart. Um, I, we've heard it from like teachers when we were little. We've heard it from our parents. And we've heard it from Disney movies, right? Just follow your heart and everything will, will, will work itself out. And uh, though it's very, I, I think, very obviously well-meaning and driven from a good place, the question, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't reflect much deep thinking, right? Because if the idea, if all we need to do is follow our heart in life, um, then what that assumes is that everything within our heart is good and true and noble. Everything within our heart is these eulogy virtues, not the resume virtues. Now, that may be true for some of y'all, and if so, that's amazing. But I, I know just from looking at my heart, I see a mix of those eulogy and resume virtues in my heart. I see some really good and noble and true stuff in there. Um, and I also see uh, mixed with that, um, you know, selfishness, greed, desire for power, desire for prestige and for, for, for financial wealth, right? So all of these things live within our heart. And I think the, uh, the hard thing about just following your heart is it assumes that uh, your heart is purely good and noble and true. Like if there's some golden statue, if you could just pull it out and follow it, everything would be fine. So I find that particularly unfulfilling because there is a mix of, uh, mix of emotions and mix of motivations within our heart. And uh, I think David Foster Wallace says it best. Um, he says, everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and most important person in existence. We rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive. But it's pretty much the same for all of us deep down. It's our default setting hardwired into our boards at birth. So I do think that there's some truth to what David Foster Wallace is saying here is that our, what is within us or the framework that we see the world through is that we are the center of the universe and we are the most important things in the universe. You can think about this even if you think about uh, how babies interact um, in, the, in the playgrounds, you know, where there's plenty of toys to go around, they will be fighting over the one toy just because somebody else has it. Um, and more, kind of more subtly as we grow up, this, this, um, this hardwiring towards self-centeredness appears in a lot of different ways. One that's really uh, prevalent right now is this idea of brand me. Brand me is a, 
uh, is a very carefully curated story that we tell the world through our social media about how sexy, smart, significant, um, intelligent, doing good in the world we are. And it's a, it's a projection of a self that's inauthentic out into the world. But it places us at the center of the world, uh, at the center of the kind of narrative and everybody else as bit players around us, right? So this idea of brand me is so prevalent. I mean, I do it, you do it, it's on our Instagram feed every day. We see, it, we see all of our friends doing it. Um, and uh, this is just like an indication of this, this kind of self-centered uh, mentality. There is uh, kind of some, a really uh, more egregious example of this is uh, Greg Mortensen's uh, book, uh, Three Cups of Tea, which was a book about bringing, uh, about one man's mission to promote peace in uh, one school at a time in Afghanistan. And his, and his attempt to tell a story that was compelling and put him at the center of, of this narrative arc about doing good and changing the world, um, he kind of really lapsed with a lot of his ethics and kind of threw truth out the window in order to tell a really good story uh, on his brand. But it happens also a little bit more subtly, you know, like this, this one right here from one of my favorite publications, The Onion. Um, six day visit to rural African village completely changes woman's Facebook profile picture forever. Um, <laughs> so like we're all, we're all kind of engaging in this in big ways and in small ways. And it's, it's just kind of our default setting of, of bringing us as the center of the universe. Um, and this happens, it, the ironic thing is it happens, it doesn't matter really what, uh, what career path you choose, whether you're packaging up uh, mortgage bonds and reselling them on Wall Street, whether you're drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico, whether you're building schools in Cambodia, um, there is a struggle between this self-centeredness and other-centeredness, between these eulogy virtues and the resume virtues that, that really uh, will always present itself. And it's a, there's always a subtle, uh, a very subtle drift to make, to make it about me and not about anybody else. There's the subtle pull and sometimes a very strong pull for it to be self-centered. Now, um, I work, I happen to work with a lot of really amazing people that are doing uh, what we would probably all in this room consider really world-changing stuff. And what I've noticed from, from their experience is um, as it gets, especially when it gets more successful and it start, you start to get a little bit more notoriety, this pull towards brand me towards uh, these resume virtues gets really strong. And this cause about, around building schools or around digging wells um, really can suddenly become much more about uh, being on the, on the front cover of Fast Company or um, you know, giving the TED Talk or writing the best-selling book, right? It becomes a little bit more about who I am and how the world sees me than actually creating real impact. And I can say this uh, uh, for myself as well. So a, uh, a key part of, of my story is really this, uh, uh, this pull between other-centeredness and self-centeredness. And you know, in my bio, the t you know, bio we talk about biography. I talked about that at, at the beginning. But that actually ended in a really big failure. Biography did not succeed for a lot of different reasons. And some of them were just business reasons, and that's fine. But a, key p a, a part of it was, or the, a, a part that I learned about myself through that process was this subtle pull towards even when you're doing the best stuff in the world to make it about ourselves. So here's how it works. Any startup is really challenging at its, at its beginning days. You're working, you're working day and night and you feel like you're laboring in obscurity. And you feel like nobody cares that you're trying to do something that you feel is really important. And nobody really gets that. And you feel very neglected and you feel like, why am I doing this? And you start to doubt, like, does this matter and is it significant? And then all of a sudden you get a little uh, pat on the back from somebody at a cocktail party saying, oh, you're just doing good work, good, good work, you know? And then it's like checks being cut to your cause. And then it's, you know, press and all this stuff. And suddenly these little dopamine hits are really what you start chasing, these dopamine hits of who am I? How can I be validated from this process? And it becomes equally about yourself as it does about creating real impact in the world. And I will say a part of my story is learning that like on the postmortem of this failure, that that was what happened in my life, is that there is this pull towards um, 
it being about me as much as it is about creating impact. So this struggle is real, and I, I, I guess I share that story with you to say that it's very, very common. Um, so there are a couple different ways that you can we can deal with this struggle, and I'm going to give kind of two frameworks for dealing uh, with the struggle between other-centeredness and self-centeredness. This, the first one is self-improvement. One approach is self-improvement, which is try harder to be better, right? Um, this approach assumes that we have everything we need to kind of conquer or at least put in check this self-centeredness, this default setting that we have in place. Um, if we only believe in ourselves and work hard, work the system, whether that be uh, you know, mindfulness, positive thinking, or even religion, if we just work hard enough at it, then we will be better and that's how we will kind of conquer this, this self-centeredness, this default setting. The problem is this approach attempts to maximize effectiveness within the default settings of self-centeredness. Uh, it's behavior modification, but not really heart modification. Nothing deeply is changing within us. We're just trying to tweak around the edges. Um, and the question that, we, that I have kind of with this is, if we're the source of the problem, are we really equipped to be the solution to that problem? I think Albert Einstein said it well when he said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. So there's, there's the one approach which is um, self-improvement. And another approach would be renewal. So renewal is kind of the Christian alternative to, is to, uh, to self-help or to self-improvement. Um, instead of working within the default setting, it actually offers a whole new operating system. So we need a whole new operating system, a fresh approach to life, and a new narrative to join in order to break free of this default setting. Um, the Christian narrative arc is basically laid out in, it could be laid out in kind of these three, these three points, creation, fall, redemption. So creation, in the beginning things were good. Um, we as humans were designed to be in relationship with God, and that relationship was harmonious, and things were good. Um, the fall. Humans, we chose to put ourselves at the center of the story. We chose to take from a other-centered view, a God-centered view, to kind of push, switch the default settings to we are now at the center of the story. And what resulted was kind of chaos and disharmony with each other and then with God as well. And then redemption. God, not content with this resulting brokenness, chose to intervene in the story by becoming human, one of us, living alongside us, then dying a criminal's death, and ultimately rising from the dead, this moment in history allows humanity to reorient ourselves back into right relationship with God. The Christian narrative takes seriously both, the, both parts of what is in our heart, both these resume virtues and the eulogy virtues, that there is goodness within us, but there is also brokenness within us that needs outside intervention to be healed and to flourish. It's this new operating system, right? So Jesus of Nazareth um, was, uh, was a person that offered both kind of the prototype, he was a prototype and the catalyst for this new operating system. In the person of Christ, we see the prototypical example of human flourishing and other centeredness. So the whole time he was walking, uh, the whole time he, he was in public, kind of in his public life uh, in the first century of Palestine, Almost everybody at every turn was asking him to grasp for more power, to step in positions of higher and higher influence and power uh, politically in his day. And at every turn, he chose to reject the path of power, prestige, and self, and chose to instead, uh, in, instead embrace other-centeredness, and to kind of try to live out, not try to, uh, actually live out this idea of this new operating system that is uh, allowing for human flourishing in a different way that, than we've ever seen before. So this new operating system, what is it? Um, in, if you uh, take some time to read uh, you know, a very kind of classic teaching that Christ gave, which is uh, the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see kind of the framework for this new operating system. It's an awareness of one's brokenness. It's empathetic. It's humble. It has a deep longing for justice. It's merciful. There's purity of motivation. It's driven by peacemaking and willing to suffer for justice. This new operating system seeks to serve instead of grabbing power. And Jesus made these challenging statements that we need to be renewed and submitted in a relationship with God for these, for these particular um, 
characteristics to really take root and really flourish within us. He says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if, a man, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. When we're living a self-centered life, when we're living this kind of life of the resume virtues, we are like that, that single seed. And it is, uh, you know, it, we have as much impact as that single seed. But this idea of renewal, this idea of resetting and, and connecting to this new operating system through a connection to God is about that seed being planted and growing into something much greater. So it, the impact that one could have uh, on one's own is significant, but the impact we could have in relationship to God actually showing this new operating system and living this new operations, operating system could be much greater and uh, exponentially more impactful. So there's a paradox. Um, these two approaches are really in conflict with each other, right? The self-improvement logic is uh, an economic logic. Logic, Input leads to output. Risk leads to, leads to reward. The renewal logic is different. It's a, uh, it's a moral logic. It's often a paradoxical logic. The last shall be first. You have to give to receive. You have to, to surrender to something outside of yourself to find strength within yourself. In order to fulfill yourself, you have to forget yourself, and you must die to live. And this is really the Christian uh, invitation. It is, in, uh, it is a paradoxical invitation. It's not an invitation to self-help. It's not that we need to try harder to be better. It's that we need renewal. It's that we need something uh, bigger than us from beyond us to change within us. And when that happens, I think that we are probably in the best, we have the best operating system from which to operate in, in the world and be able to uh, accelerate our impact and really have a significant life um, that will be eulogy worthy. So thank you. So much for that. Yeah. So um, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, and so. Uh, Do you? Yeah. You just popped up on the stage. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll go through those first, and then we will have time for questions from the audience. So um, first question is a little bit more about you. It seems kind of ironic that I would ask you to talk a little bit more about yourself when yeah. you just decried self-centeredness. Uh -huh. But can you tell me about how your faith actually informs the work that you do? Yeah, so I think the, um, there's, a, there's a couple different touch points there. Um, when I talked about in law school and my, my um, m deeper opening to kind of social justice or my, my eyes opening to social justice, it was a really interesting combination of a lot of factors. Um, I have been for a long time, but particularly then was really into U2. Any U2 fans here? Yes, yes thank you, cool. <laughs> We got some excitement around that. I didn't know if that's like generally, it seems generationally like everybody, like a, every generation. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, there was some really interesting stuff that Bono was talking about at that point in time around 05, um, uh, around kind of some political stuff, which is called the Jubilee Movement, which I thought was really fascinating. And the way that he was uh, engaging the conversation around uh, economic and social justice, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, a part of that was really based in scripture. Um, and as somebody that grew up in church my whole life, um, he, he quoted some verses that I had always heard and, uh, but took a new meaning to me. So um, it, was, uh, it was Matthew 25 that says, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. And I, growing up, I always thought that means like, kind of be nice to people, like that kid that's picked on in school, like try to be like, the person that stands up for them or like maybe give some money to the homeless person. I never looked at that scripture within the context of the global least of these. And once I did really start to take that seriously, it was a little bit um, jarring and it, it, um, it shook me in a way that I didn't expect basically. That this simple verse that I'd heard my whole life took on this new context and kind of wouldn't let me go. It, kind of, it was kind of something within me that was uh, kept banging around until I had to say, okay, I need to kind of take this seriously. And it changed, it changed my worldview and it changed my sense of what justice was. 
So I think I think that that's uh, that's one touch point at the, which is kind of more catalytic side, um, and then you, you know a lot of I, I do like a, a lot of work for any sort of good is a um, is hard, it's very challenging, and it can be discouraging when you don't see a lot of progress. It can be uh, very, uh, just feel very lonely. And there were many times throughout my career and, and uh, during biography and after biography with, with kind of running the law firm, um, which kind of both are key parts of what I felt were, were my, um, a part of the story that I could play. Um, there, were many, there were many times when I thought, I think I'm pursuing something that's right and just, but it just doesn't feel like it's working out. Like it doesn't feel like the ideas and the concepts that I feel nudged towards, or if you want to use the word called towards, um, are work going to work out financially? You know, is, is this going to really make sense uh, for me? Am I going to be able to live if I, if I go after this uh, pursuit? And so there's a lot of times uh, of just a ton of prayer and saying, God, am I hearing you correctly? Because I think I'm hearing you say this, but it doesn't seem to match up with what my experience is. Um, and I remember, this is kind of a, a stupid, cheesy story, but um, I remember uh, there was one of these times when I, I felt like um, it was really, really struggling financially to make this law firm work. And I was praying, like, is this the right path for me? Should I be doing something else? And it was on, on that day that a particular law passed in New York um, creating a new type of legal structure that I've been very passionate about and been a big advocate for. And during that day of me, me and some of my friends were really praying about this that day. During that day, the, the news broke. And I remember sitting in front of my computer when I, when I saw that email from my friends saying, hey, it passed. I broke out into tears. And I was so joyful that this stupid law passed that probably nobody really cares about. And I, um, I, I will say, ex I did experience a, a word from God saying, uh, you are so excited about this. You are so passionate about this. You shouldn't be doing anything else. If you're crying over the stupid legislation passing, then like, this, is your, this is a good indication of you're doing something that's in line with, with where you should be. Yeah. Well, let me ask a follow-up question to that. Oftentimes, we define success monetarily yeah. so we figure out a way to monetize it and so if you're not making money off of it mm -hmm. I guess converse could be if you're not like 100 percent happy all the time then it's not successful mm -hmm. so when you're trying to measure success how do you measure it well i mean i would like to say that i'm a eulogy virtues guy right um but i i mean all the other stuff is important too like yeah you know i want to be uh, I want to be leading the field. I want to be, have have thought leadership. I want to be. Um, I want. I want vo the voices to be heard on this particular these causes that I care about. Um, and so, a part of that is this external resume success that is required for things to move forward. So I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I do want to be the type of person that cares more about long-term impact than short-term impact. And I think long-term impact is much more about relationships and guiding long-term relationships, uh, movement building towards an end goal. And I guess another question related to that, mm -hmm. does God want everybody to be resume successful? I don't know that he cares. I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to this, but I don't, I don't know that he cares. Honestly, I mean, you, you look at, if we just look at Christ, like, was he resume successful? Homeless, wandering the streets, not a penny to his name, uh, with some a band of ragtag kind of cobbled together people, I don't know that that's super resume successful. I don't think Mary, his mom, was like my son. You know, <laughs> could have been a carpenter, and all of a sudden he's out wandering or wandering the streets. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't know that that I don't know that that's um, essential. I don't think it's bad. I don't know that it's essential. Mm. Yeah. So. How and why do we good work for good in the world? How and why? Yeah. Those are two big questions. Um, the why question is interesting to me. I think um, that's something that is probably the most is the most important before the how question in my mind. I have a lot of friends 
most of my friends, I would say, would not consider them, they would consider themselves uh, spiritual but not religious, right? Um, as probably a lot of your friends do. And they are doing really great work in the world and they're, in, in some cases, having a lot of impact. And uh, the way I think about um, spirituality is that there's a, a horizontal uh, paradigm to it and there's a vertical paradigm to it. So this horizontal paradigm is how does our spirituality uh, allow us to connect and impact other human beings ideally positively, right? And you know, you could use the framework of this new operating system that I put up that Christ talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. You could use other frameworks. But um, that is something that I, I think can be done from any perspective. There is a lot of this good horizontal work happening. I think what is a little bit um, uh, novel or different about my friends that claim, uh, claim a religious faith um, and I'll say specifically for me that that faith would be Christianity, um, is this, this, hor or this vertical connection to, to God, right? So this is about humans' connection to a higher power, in this case, God. And that has been very instrumental for me because most of my friends um, that are spiritual but not religious are making up their own set, their own moral framework, and they're saying, this works for me, this is how I see the world, and so I'm going to build, build my ethical system around that, um, which is, can do a lot of good, obviously. Uh, the thing that challenges me most, and actually the hardest thing about this vertical relationship, is that I don't get to make that up. Like the, the, the system of what is human flourishing and the system of what it means to be fully human and what it means to be in connection to God is something that I that is beyond me and that I don't get to change if it's not convenient for me. And that is a challenging thing, but I will say it's also has a flip side of being a good thing as well. So in this subtle pull towards self-centeredness, if we have our own system and are basically just focused on the horizontal, we'll just kind of float around whatever kind of makes whatever is convenient for us at the moment. But if we have this vertical connection to God, it stands as an anchor, both an anchor which says this is a truth, right? There's, it's very hard to, say, to have truth claims when everybody just says this is true for me and this is true for you, so whatever, you know? Um, but whenever there is a, that vertical connection, it begs a truth claim to say this is right. I'm either conforming to that or I'm not but at least I know that this, this is the standard. And it points as a North Star, and I think for me, um, a part of this kind of post-mortem of the failure of biography and my um, draw towards self-centeredness was I had to take a serious look at like, am I really living out the, these, these, op these characteristics that Christ talks about? And I, if, if I'm honest, you know, I could try to fudge and say I kind of am, but if I'm honest, the answer is no. But that truth claim was outside of myself and, and built into this vertical connection. So the why is, for me, I, I think why has to be both horizontal and vertical. The how, I mean, I don't know. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you about social enterprise. Um, what can it do? What can it not do? Basically, what are the strengths and weaknesses of sure. social enterprise? Sure. Sure. So, uh, has, who has heard of the term social enterprise? Raise your hand. Cool. That's a, man, this is great. Like, if I did this eight years ago, there'd be like two people raising their hand, and it's great. So I'm loving that you guys are thinking about this stuff. Social enterprise is thinking about um, innovative approaches to solve social and environmental problems, right? And um, the, in, the, on the uh, kind of the more classic nonprofit side, it's shaping, shaking up what we think of as traditional philanthropy, trying to make it more rigorous and more results-based and more impactful. Um, on the business side, it's thinking about how the market can be leveraged for both social and environmental results as well as financial results. I like to think of it as uh, taking the mind of Henry Ford with the heart of Gandhi. Those two together equal social enterprise, right? Um, and it's, it's about rigorous application of, of business methods to, to achieve these, these uh, goals other than financial goals. Um, what it can do is, uh, I think it can do a lot. Uh, there um, it has a broad ranging application and it's, you know, on the for-profit side, there are a lot of things that 
if the market readjusted a little bit or if an individual company readjusted a little bit to say instead of focusing on a narrow aperture of success being purely financial, if we opened up that aperture a little bit and said we want to create intentionally a social and environmental impact, there's a lot of stuff that business can help solve for. Business has oftentimes been seen as a net negative for creating uh, for social and environmental impact, right? That business and big corporations are creating huge environmental degradation and creating bigger wealth disparity and bigger um, social disharmony. But the application of these principles in the for-profit world can be very interesting because they can fill some gaps in a very unique and efficient way that uh, they haven't been filled before. But there is limits of social enterprise in the sense that there are always things that will need to be handled by the, um, by the government sector and by the more traditional philanthropic sector. You know, you're never going to be able to, or it will be unlikely that you'd be able to find a good, you know, we'll say for-profit business in orphans, right? Like that's a hard thing to kind of tackle through kind of for-profit social enterprise. And it would be challenging to do post-disaster relief kind of in the social enterprise thing, at least, at least right away. So, um, and then a lot of government services work much better at scale with a government's intermediary. Uh, regulation works better at scale. So there are limits to it. Okay. So uh, Christians have been involved in social enterprise, however you want to call it, for a long time. So sometimes it's ex explicitly enterprise, mm -hmm. like oftentimes it's missions. Um, and there's good that's come out of it. There's also bad stuff that's come out of it. Sure. You know, like it's association with colonialism mm -hmm. and other types of things. So um, uh, how would you respond to problematic situations um, or even problematic examples through history, especially from your perspective as a Christian? Sure. So I've spent a decent amount of time in East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so there is really complicated history there with Christianity um, and specifically kind of from the colonial white perspective coming into Africa. Um, and uh, the, the, the ways and means and methods um, oftentimes left a lot to be desired and uh, in some ways have been very uh, negatively impactful. Um, so I just think that needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be understood uh, in my mind as a misapplication of a principle, right? Um, but that doesn't disprove, in my mind, that doesn't disprove the principle. So. When I think about, have, has anybody read the Poisonwood Bible? It's a, it's a fiction story, but I think it's a great, it's a great uh, character drawing of, the, of this family that goes into the Congo and um, just how weird it gets, really, basically, um, whenever, whenever there's this ap ap cultural application of Christianity onto a context that just completely makes no sense. I would say the, the issue, primary issues there is it becomes, uh, it pulls, it comes back to this default setting of self-centeredness. Self so if in our desire to spread the gospel, it really becomes much more about us and our version of the gospel and how we want people to change and conform to my particular cultural mindset, then that's probably really much more about that person having a misaligned heart towards those resume virtues and towards um, self-centeredness than it is uh, about anything else, I would say. Great, thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Who's gonna be the brave first one? Yeah. Always tough, always tough. Please Come. stand up so we can hear you. Oh, all right. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned, I, th I think that we're, many of us are on the same page of wanting to be people of significance right. rather than like success as, as, like, as you've defined it. Um, but we live in a world that evaluates and assesses and passes and fails based on resume success. Yep. And so what, what are your thoughts on the balance between living in a world that, where like if you, for instance, if you wanted to do anything successfully as a lawyer, I'm sure that there were people who had to um, impress to like basically allow, like to be placed into a position to have an impact, if that makes sense. Sure. 
Yeah, so I, I would say, first of all, like in a pursuit of significance, we, um, we should not, uh, it should not be an excuse to be uh, lackadaisical or to not pursue excellence in, uh, in where we are at the moment. So if that's school, you know, or w whatever your job is, it's not an excuse to say, this stuff doesn't matter, so I'm not going to apply myself. That's actually selling yourself way short, honestly. And uh, I, I wouldn't, I would strongly recommend against that. And I actually think that the people that are most impactful to create significance are excellent at whatever their particular field is. They just happen to be applying it in a little bit of a different methodology or towards a different end than other people would, right? So it's the, it's the people that make the most impact are the brilliant people that are hardworking, um, but are not doing it for the check marks on the resume. They're doing it because the craft matters, because doing well is important, and because when that's applied to a certain, uh, towards a certain end, other people will flourish due to that. So that's, that's the way I think about it. And it's not an excuse to say, all right, because I you know, may get a big head about uh, getting press or whatever it might be, I should shy away from that. It's to say I need to enter into that uh, with, a, uh, with a proper mentality. And for me, that goes back to kind of this, this vertical alignment between me and God, understanding that like, I need to be continually renewed and I need to be checking myself both with my personal relationship to God and also I think um, something that's always been very important to me is my, my community around me, right? People in my life that are willing to be open and honest with me about how they see kind of me um, shape-shifting in, in certain ways and are able to say, dude, what are you doing, you know? So I think both of those things are important. I mean, it's not, we should still pursue excellence, um, even though we're pursuing these uh, eulogy virtues. Yes. Um, you mentioned checking yourself, and it sounds like there's a good deal of reflection and discernment that goes into deciding where your motivations are. Sure. So I was wondering, what practices have been helpful for you, um, if you want to call them virtual disciplines or whatever, um, through the years to help you self-evaluate? Sure. I, um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm noticing is, um, if, uh, actually especially for my friends that would, would call themselves spiritual but not religious, um, is there is, it's becoming really hot right now to have some spiritual practice in your life, right? To have some, to have some uh, rhythm that happens or, or some, some manifestation of, of practicing some spirituality. I think for me that's, that's important, it's very important. A couple things that come to mind are um, how I start my day, how I, how I get things going in the morning. And so for me, I try to, and I sometimes succeed at, um, uh, not checking my phone the first thing in the, in the, uh, when I wake up. Like how many of us wake up and then just, the first thing we do is we have, our, before our eyes are even adjusted, we're like squinting at these glowing squares, you know? It's like, I think somebody emailed me while I was asleep and it must be dealt with right now. Um, there's, uh, I, I tend to think that that sets us, our day up uh, in a defensive manner as opposed to a proactive manner. What I like to do instead is to uh, take some time to center myself. And for me, that looks like prayer, meditation, and, and, and scripture reading, um, and oftentimes a run, you know. And um, so that's, that's an important piece. I will say uh, also, like, uh, I like to have, so that's a daily rhythm. I like to have weekly rhythms, and I like to have kind of annual rhythms, right? So the weekly rhythm is I like to uh, meet with fellow believers in a church congregation on a weekly basis, pretty much weekly basis. And the cool, uh, <clears throat> every faith, every Christian tradition is a little bit different, but in my Christian tradition, we have a fairly liturgical rhythm. And what that means is uh, that we have a confession every week. And there's a point in the service that we acknowledge our uh, commission and omission in, in, our, in our failings, that, that we have acted in ways that are out of line with this new operating system, and that we have not acted in ways that should be in line, right? And there is something beautiful about communally acknowledging I have failed, you know? I have failed and I have, I have fallen short, you know? Um, and then Eucharist is also a, a key part of that, which is, uh, which is communion. Um, 
Uh, these, these two pieces of rhythm are really important. And then annually for me, I like to spend uh, a week, a year in the wilderness unplugged. Um, so no, no screens, no, nobody can get a hold of me. Um, and uh, try to get some good time out of the city as well. So, you know, three or four weeks out of the city as well. the balance between uh, resume virtues and eulogy virtues. So I want, I want to know, what's the core momentum for you to pursue that balance? What's the core moment? Sorry, momentum. Momentum, got gotcha. you. Um, what will drive you? Yeah. To constantly seeking that balance. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you don't have to stay standing if you don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, what's the momentum? I think sometimes, honestly, it gets exhausting, and it is, um, there's no momentum. And there is a, a feeling of, like, from time to time, um, why am I worrying so much about this? Just whatever, you know? Just kind of whatever. I think those are, those are the times that I am probably less effective and probably, honestly, less fulfilled. Um, the times that I am able to um, be continually engaged vertically and horizontally with my friends are the, are the times that that momentum continues to kind of go as a, as a flywheel. I will say that it's like there's no shame in that momentum ebbing and flowing. I think that that happens very often. I think it's a very normal thing for us uh, in any part of our life, but even for spiritual, for that to kind of feel more intense at moments and less intense at moments. I would say that that doesn't mean that that's not real. And so if, you're, if you've felt that or are feeling that, that is an okay and a natural rhythm, but the, the presence of God is still in that and there is a driving anima animating spirit that is, is pushing things forward. So on another hand, any more questions? In the back. I read Bob Goff's book about you know, a lawyer like yourself who does a lot of work. He views his law practices as a more or less fundraising for his nonprofit work. Now, how does that really relate to CRPO? Um, would you say that social enterprise is almost a more, uh, a more successful version of that, whereas instead of making money one day and uh, you know, using that money for a good means another day, uh, you can actually do both at the same time? Or do you think that the two methods um, should both act different yeah, I mean, I think, I think Bob and uh, contrasting Bob's life and my life, um, you, I will feel woefully inadequate, first of all. Um, but secondly, I think it's a really great generational divide, right? So he's about my dad's age, and he would think about the success. Well, he's, he's actually thinking about success and significant parallel at this point in his life. Um, but he felt like I need to go create this success over here, over here I need to do my good, right? Success over here, significance over here. I, I, that bifurcation between success and significance or in business between profit and purpose is, uh, is something that I would love to see drop in our generation. I would love for that to be something that, is, that goes by the wayside. Um, for the history of philanthropy, people have not thought Andrew Carnegie who's one of the first and biggest philanthropists in the U.S., um, made his money in a fairly, like, dirty way, you know? Uh, there was no consideration to his workers and to maybe the environmental impact, although there wasn't as much environmental awareness then, so you have to, you have to curve based on his, his peers at some level, right? Um, but still, it was made in, a, in an unconscious manner, and then he gave a lot of it away. And, and I think this... Uh, this bifurcation with like not thinking about good at all over here, just thinking about maximizing profit, and then thinking about giving some, sprinkling a little bit around so I can feel a little bit, maybe you know, oftentimes that's more about me feeling less bad about myself than it is about actually creating impact. I think that that mentality is actually very hurtful to the impact sector, and it results in less impact because the donor in that case feels that the impact is made when that check is cut, not when actually things are being done. So there's zero accountability between where the revenue stream 
for that, we'll say, as, as a social organization is coming from, and their actually their outputs or their outcomes, how they're actually changing the world. The only the only way so they could not do well, and they could still get that check cut because as long as as long as that uh, wealthy person feels good about cutting that check, then everything's good, right? Um, so. I would say this bifurcation between success and significance, between profit and purpose, is something that will be less. Uh, my hope is by the time um, by the time we we pass on that that will be uh, a little bit of passe thing that will be in the history books. I'm an optimist, though. Um, okay. Well, I have a different question, but as you were saying that. I thought of another one, so I'm going to ask that instead. Sounds good. Because uh, it seems more relevant. Um, in looking at the separation between profit and purpose, at at some like threshold of income, like below a certain threshold of income, it's you you can't really make. It, it's hard for those two things to come together, right? Because if I can't put food on my table for my kids, then I have to accept a job somewhere that might not be having the global impact or might not be um, I might not be a job that I feel like I'm making an impact in but I have to make that decision because I have to have income so do you think this connection between being successful and having um, purpose or having mean whatever with this connection between the two can only come after, re after reaching like a certain income threshold yeah. or a, a certain social class or something like that. Yeah. So I think that I th again, I think that that's like a a, a framework that um, our parents' generation would de like. Probably all of our parents are telling us that, right? First, like at least maybe get yourself taken care of, then think about doing good stuff. And what I would say is that um, there's a different way to think about it, and it's not an either or. Uh, this. It's not either like the success then significance um, has to be there or like the significance has to be there right away. What, uh, what we could, the way I like to think about approaching my career is an iterative approach towards success and significance. And what that means is um, making small bets towards uh, very small bets in the direction of what type of great impact we want to make long term. So if you think of, um, if, if you think of my story, um, it's a really, it shouldn't have worked out, and it's a really risky way to go. If, you, if you're going to use a poker analogy, I went all in on my first hand that I was dealt, and that, for so many reasons, should have failed. So I don't necessarily recommend that. I think it's a stupid thing to do. Um, <laughs> but I, I will say um, that if you can stay at the table, learn skills, build up a little bit of a pile, then you can start to make bigger and bigger bets as you go down the line. And what I would think about is, like, generally speaking, what is the impact that I'm drawn towards, and what, where can I actually have contribution? So it's it's my passion meets my skill in something that is going to actually like have a good impact on the world, right? Um, and start to make small bets in that direction, even as you're in your first year of your job, second year of your job, third year of your job, and before you know it, you might be finding yourself spending all of your nights and weekends working on something that is like all about impact, and that would be amazing. And then before you know it, it might flip. You might say. Wow, I'm going to actually spend full time doing this, and it's doable for me now. So, I would just say my my recommendation would be an iterative iterative approach, making small bets in the direction towards which we are drawn by our passions and our skills. More questions? Uh, well, let's see. Well, let's go here first, and then back. So. Okay. Um, I don't know if it was. I think it, um, the question is multidimensional. So was it worth it for the women that we affected? We probably affected a tiny amount of women, and um, they had to work hard, learn a new skill, and like net net, would they be better if we hadn't ever been there? Potentially, like potentially that would have been better if it had scaled up and been self-sustaining. Then it. Would have been better than than either of those those um, scenarios. Um, I think for the people that were working on this, um, it was pretty shaping for all of us, and uh, it brought out the best and worst in all of us. 
and uh, I think we learned a lot about ourselves through that process. Is it fair to do self-exploration on, on you know, this population set that we were trying to help? I don't know. It's, it's something that I don't know the answer to, and it, it, it uh, yeah. Do you have another question? Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when you're doing this kind of social entrepreneurship work from a Christian perspective, um, and a lot of it is modeled after things that Jesus said about um, feeding the poor and serving the least of these and that kind of thing, which is all part of restoration of the earth here and now from a Christian perspective. But also as a Christian, you know this greater truth that will guarantee um, more eternal um, happiness or like that that is based in eternity as opposed to just like on earth, so how do you balance those two things when you're doing this kind of work that like, I could put clothes on this person's back and satisfy their needs now, but I also know something that will satisfy their needs like for eternity, and how do you kind of merge those two? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, um, you know, going back to the, kind of the example of poorly done missionary work, it's a, it's a, uh, a key part of it has been an um, overemphasis on, um, you know, conversion, overemphasis on um, this, this eternal without an emphasis on understanding what the needs are in the community at that point in time. I don't know, if I have to err on one side or the other, I err on meeting, meeting people where, the, where they are in that moment and delivering real, really caring for them um, in a way that is meaningful. I, I, I think that uh, is, you know, that's my perspective on, on the, if I have to err on one side or the other, I'm going to err on that side. And I think that that is a more uh, potentially more pure version of love uh, instead of just saying like, hey, I want to get you to take an action. Um, it's just to say, how, how can I give to you? How can I, how can I serve you? How can I set context and system up so that there's flourishing? The, um, so yeah. That's my that's my take on it. Though I you know I, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, so that would there was a lot of people that would disagree with me on that. <laughs> I was going to ask a follow up to what you answered to Griffin's question. How has how how has your work with biography shaped your law practice now in terms of how you counsel, advise, and sort of consult with budding social? Yeah, I think it's made me more empathetic to how hard it is, and um, and you know one of our one of our core values is uh, you know there's three uh, experience em empathy, experience, and clarity, and I think all of those were learned in the trenches from trying to do trying to work with friends to build something that we thought was really meaningful, and uh, understanding how intensely difficult it is to get anything done. Um, so I think it's just. Uh, made me more empathetic and understanding that this stuff is really hard and um, more practically like there are a lot of uh, sustainable and socially conscious fashion brands that um, work with us and am able to say hey if you don't figure out this particular piece of the puzzle like this probably isn't going to be around next year you know yeah so uh, if you know of uh Mm -hmm. Like with everything you've learned, everything you know now, uh, where do you get started in a way that, that might be that might make a difference? Yeah, I, I think there's there's two ways to kind of learn and um, yeah, two ways to learn. One is through reading, and one is through experience. Um, I would say on the reading side, tr probably try not to read books that are written by founders. Those are generally um, designed to have a really clean narrative arc to show how great this organization is so you can give them money. Um, so I would say probably stay away from those books. Look more towards the books written by journalists that are probably more interested in, in finding like what might be true in the story. Um, and then secondly, just anything, any touch point of being on the ground and serving in any capacity in any organization, even if it's like 
my skill is accounting and I am, you know, being a housekeeper, or whatever it might be. Though long term you don't want to do that, but short term, just being on the ground and having experience opens up your eyes so much to all the naivete and all the pre preconceived notions that you have about what it means to actually do good in the world. Because doing good is really hard. Um, the general kind of like current of society is more towards self uh, and you're pushing against that stream. So getting clear on the realities of that early is super helpful. Hey, Stacy. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering what are some of your goals moving forward professionally with the work that you do? Are you looking to hire me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, honestly, like I really, I feel like I've got my dream job right now. I'm super, I'm really loving what I'm doing. This blend of a couple different things I enjoy teaching side, I feel like it's helpful to think about how the next generation of lawyers can be impactful. I like the writing to think about larger issues and I like the, I particularly like the one-on-one -on -one work. So all of that's great for me. Um, you know, I, I probably, um, if I don't do anything else for the rest of my life, if I keep doing this until I die, I'll be a very happy person, but there'll probably be some other opportunities on the, uh, on, uh, to be at different seats in the table at, at some point in my life. Any more questions? Okay, well, please join me in thanking Kyle for his wonderful presentation. Cool. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.